Hello, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sébastien Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, we're here today with uh, Lisa Cheng. Lisa Cheng is uh, the founder of Vanbex, and she was also previously working in uh, doing business development for MasterCoin. And we're going to talk today about uh, about crowd sales and crowdfunding in the cryptocurrency space. She's been very involved in that, and you know we all know it's it's an exciting space, and, and there's so much uh, so much happening there. So thanks for joining us today, Lisa. Thanks for having me, guys. Looking forward to the show. And um, Epicenter is one of the shows that I watch. So thank you for inviting me on today. Well, we're certainly glad to hear that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think the, the we we have had topics, uh, we have had shows on this topic a few times. We had uh, Joel on from Swarm, we've had Tom Ding on from Coinify, and we've had uh, quite a few projects on that that went on to do their own crowd sales. We've had uh, a few several times. We've had people from Ethereum on, we've had Gems on. Uh, well, Swarm itself was do, they they were doing their own crowd sale, and and there may well be some other ones. Well, Factum. Uh, and there are probably some that I've forgotten. So it's even when we look at our sort of our sample, this is a very prominent topic, and it seems to be a prominent topic in the space in general. So Lisa, can you give us a bit of a maybe brief introduction to the evolution of the crowdfunding space? And sure. Um, so just to give some background, um, I started off with uh, the crowd sales in Bitcoin um, during my days at MasterCoin. Um, prior to joining MasterCoin, um, there was still crowdfunding happening within Bitcoin on forums like Bitcoin Talk, and uh, people were doing, um, you know, going to places like Bitfunder, going to threads that were purchasing, um, you know, ASIC miner shares, and um, they were doing a kind of crypto equity that kind of went away uh, as um, I guess Bitcoin became more mainstream. And um, during that time, MasterCoin did their initial crowd sale. And um, so they helped create a protocol to launch coins and MadeSafe was their first crowd sale on MasterCoin. Um, there were others that happened after like uh, separately such as Counterparty and uh, several that happened on Counterparty. and I was mostly working on MasterCoin, so I was able to kind of be around there for MadeSafe, and then I was part of Tatiana Coin and um, a few others as well. Yeah, all projects that, uh, well, as Brian mentioned, that we've mentioned on the show. In fact, we've had Tatiana on and uh, and others. So out out of that, uh, so from that initial experience, uh, what were you able to learn that sort of uh, enabled you to start? the Vanbex group after that? Sure. Um, so one thing that uh, being at MasterCoin, and especially being there for the whole made safe thing that happened, um, I learned that it's really key to kind of get the message across um, early about the project, communicating what the project is doing from a technical standpoint, um, what it is under the hood, as well as like the business itself. How are they going to use the money? Um, who is behind the project, and seeing all of the negativity that happened with some crowd sales, um, I, I've learned that you know a white paper is important to communicate what the project is about, um, how it's going to be built, you know what is it actually going to do, and then from a transparency side, you have to go out there early and talk about the project. Go on to the forums, the threads, the places where you know people are getting their information, especially who you're trying to sell the coin to. Bitcoin people, they're you know, kind of a certain demographic. Um, they go to certain places, and uh, you have to go to those places to tell your story. Otherwise, you're going to miss them. And if you're trying to get Bitcoins, um, you, know, you have to go where they are. I mean, I, I think the kind of interesting, the interesting thing to put in perspective here too is that you know crowdfunding is a is a pretty new thing as well. I mean, I was I was looking at the Wikipedia page of crowdfunding before, and it mentioned that the first time the term crowdfunding was even used was like 2006 or something. You know, it's like not even 10 years ago. And uh, you know, 
Kickstarter is was started in 2009. So you know it's it's very uh, it's a very new development. And what is what's interesting too is that you know it's it's a tricky thing crowdfunding, right? Because legally it's often challenging. So um, Bitcoin, I think for a few reasons, right? Bitcoin is so like uniquely it's such a unique match with um, with crowdfunding you know for one reason it's just that there's no you know there's no problems getting people from all over the world to, to support your project right because they, they can just do a Bitcoin transactions so there's no, no, no problem there whereas otherwise uh, you're gonna have to work with payment processors and then that's it's not at least it's not possible to do on your own and you have to go to a platform to do that right so I think that's that's really interesting and uh, then I guess the other one, I guess we, we forgot to mention that before when we're giving sort of an introduction to the topic, is David Johnston and that whole DAPS concept, uh, which of course brings a whole other level in, in that you're, you're sort of able to give incentives to people. Yeah, I think um, the whole evolution of crowdfunding, uh, I guess it is still very young. I didn't realize that it only started, you know, less than 10 years ago. Um, I mean, there may have been some things before, but I think sort of in earnest, in a, in a more serious way, I mean, I think it's still a very much nascent, and, and well, there, there are a few different uh, few different areas, you No, know, people do um, the, um, the lending, right, so, like, sure. lending club, and, and we have to have Bitcoin as well, mm -hmm. and, like, Bitbond, for example. Yeah, microloans, too. And then equity crowdfunding, actually, here in Germany, it's, it's, uh, there are some platforms to do that. It's like I think it's more more possible than in the US where it's it's extremely restricted. Yeah. Did, didn't that just get opened up recently though in the US as well with some sort of jobs act that opened up uh crowd sort of crowdfunding to uh, I, the equity market? Yeah, non accredited investors you can yes, raise right. to a million. They haven't formalized the jobs act specifically. It's still very vague, but um so the legislation right now is that you can't uh, accept money, you can't, you know, promote your company um, unless they're accredited investors, which means that you make over a hundred thousand a year or you have like a million in assets. Um, and so Kickstarter was interesting in that they weren't selling equity. Um, you could raise, you know, money um, by doing a product. Um, what was the VR project that they raised? I keep Oculus saying, Rift. Yes. Oculus Rift. They were the one, I think, that really put Kickstarter in, in the purview of a lot of people and they helped people mm -hmm. realize that it could be successful um, and they went on to sell to Facebook. But um, yeah, I, Bitcoin sits on this gray area where you know we don't know who people are that are buying uh, or supporting these crypto crowd sales because Bitcoin is anonymous in a sense um, and there's no limitations on geography. So we can't just say this country is going to be regulated this way. Um, so yeah, I think crowd sales and uh, Kickstarters are kind of, they're less than 10 years old. And maybe in four years from now, it will look different. So what, basically what you're saying is that there's tremendous challenge because, because Bitcoin is what it is, right? It is completely centralized. Uh, it's uh, accessible to anyone worldwide, so you don't have these restrictions. But at the same time, I think that the crowdfunding, the crowdfunding space, uh, even though it is quite young, as we've mentioned, it's sort of ripe for uh, to be <laughs> kickstarted again, I guess. Um, because I mean, I, I've never personally, I've never spent any money on Kickstarter. But I think Brian, you were mentioning uh, that you, you know, invested or you know, uh, sort of well, funded not, a, yeah. a lot of projects that you didn't get anything in the end. Uh, I think well, that's the experience for a lot of people. You don't get any magnets or T-shirts? Well, I mean, actually, this is something I've been thinking a lot about, and maybe this is the right place to bring it up. Um, and it's not directly related to cryptocurrency, although it applies here certainly as well. And I think crowdfunding uh, is an is an interesting thing, right? Because when you the incentives are very strange. So if I start a Kickstarter project. Uh, for example, for some sort of uh, gadget, some technological gadget, then you know generally these people haven't actually produced it yet. They have some plan of they want to do this thing, 
and now they try to raise the money and when they raise the money they go to try actually do it so obviously I want to get as many people as excited as possible for this project so I'm gonna promise like as much as I can make a really nice cool video and you know it's gonna be like deliver soon to your door have it by Christmas type thing um, so if you, you know you have that incentive to promise a lot but then the downside is that well one it's difficult to do hardware right you have to deal with customs and factories in China and all kinds of things uh, two is these people generally have no experience uh, and then things go wrong right so uh, I, I think that's the sort of interesting thing about even uh, an established uh, crowdfunding site like Kickstarter is uh, they it's presented as if you are buying a product right like you're buying this thing and it's going to be delivered at a certain time but you're not you're buying a, a a promise that if they actually can do it they will give it to you, you know, hopefully roughly at that time the general it's like a year later or something so I mean yeah I mean personally I've had a pretty terrible record that some projects just never did never did anything like fell apart ran, I don't know what they did you know but uh, presumably it was because they over promised and they didn't have the necessary competence to deliver really? Maybe uh, and um, so that's an interesting tension and I, I think that's something that I wasn't so aware of before it's just kind of over time with using Kickstarter and Indiegogo it's become clear um, and of course you. yeah so what was it that drew you to invest in those projects the ones yeah, just there were like cool things like oh I want to have that right like uh, you know it wasn't available elsewhere because often it's very kick Cutting edge products, right? And was it products. Good video? Like, did they have a really good video? Did they like? What was it that? Set of course, them? right. There's a great video. There's a lot of promises of cool features and stuff. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, you're probably not the only one. No, no. I think this is a. I think this is just a fundamental characteristic of this, and it's of course the same thing in the cryptocurrency space, right? So when you uh, launch your, your crowd, uh, your crowd sale, your project. You want to make a lot of great promises uh, that's going to be uh, available soon. That it's going to be able to do a lot of things, and that you can do all this stuff mm -hmm. because you want people to to invest in that. And you know, mostly, I'm sure with sincere intentions, and like you believe it can do it. But that being said, uh, of course, implementing it is often harder than uh, coming up with the plan, right? I think the good thing about crypto crowd sales in particular is because there's that um, there's that stage where the community comes out and points out all the holes in the project, and there's that vetting process right. where like, hey, you are where are you going to spend the money, and who are the people behind this, and it's like you have to overcome those challenges, and if you don't have those answers ready, then you're losing a customer. But do you feel this really happens? I do. Or because personally, I mean, to some extent, I'm sure you're right, right, it does happen. Um, but personally, I feel like that's one of the, those are the flip sides of crowdfunding is because you're selling to a thousand people or ten thousand people. Nobody has the resources or even the interest or the know-how to like really deeply look into this thing, which is something very different than if you try to raise money from venture capitalists, right, where they're like, you know, they really look at you, meet with you in person, talk with uh, people who work with you, look at your plans, etc. Uh, and and I think you don't have to have a crowd. Uh, I mean, of course, at the same time, uh, there are there are other upsides, right? And you do have to crowd, especially in Bitcoin, right? There are a lot of critical people that do give to. Uh, totally agree. Um, there were a lot of people that came up to me afterwards and were like, "Oh, I put money into this project and." You know, I'm so excited. It's gonna release, and I was like, "Did you check out Reddit and Bitcoin Talk?" And they're like, "No, I never go on there." I'm like, okay, well, you know, you have to do your own research as a consumer. Um, and uh, some people, yeah, you know, like you said, Brian, they don't have time to do that. So, uh, so but, one, one yeah. thing that I'd like to point out is that, that makes uh, crypto crowdfunding so different than regular crowdfunding. It's it's a, it's a different type of product, right? In one on one hand, the Kickstarter, Indiegogo, mostly we're talking about physical products that need to, like you said, Brian, be manufactured in, in China or something like that. Uh, when you're talking about crypto crowdfunding, for the most part now, at least I think, I mean, it's mostly been software, and there's a completely different dynamic as well. Uh, is that the software is often accompanied by a coin, in which you sort of become a, a 
a holder, and, and I don't want to say it, but you know, you, you in, some, some, some would say invest in that uh, project. Yeah. Um, although that's not how it's framed. So it'd be interesting to see, I guess, in in some near future, if uh, we start seeing physical products, uh, and if the same sort of problems occur. Of course, net right now. Uh, with regards to the software, like you just mentioned, is you can go and you can, I mean, most of the software is open source, you can go and have a look, you know, what the source code is uh, and point out the holes or the eventual problems. No, which yeah, is much I more mean, difficult yeah. with physical products. No, I think this is a great point, actually, Sebastian, you bring up. And this is also one of the reasons why I'm, um, I, I don't feel as, uh, I don't feel that a lot of the uh, cryptocurrency crowdfunding projects are as problematic because let's take an example of Ethereum. So you buy Ether, I mean, everybody knows that this is risky and uh, that, you know, they're going to try to build this thing and you know, hopefully they will do it and hopefully they will do it in time, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and there is that potential that it's going to gain a lot in value so you get compensated for your risk, right? So, so it absolutely does have this sort of investment type or share type uh, character. And, and you don't have that with Kickstarter, right? It's like in the best case, you get what they promised you on time and you have your whatever thing for $100 or something. But, in the world, but you don't get com compensated for the risk you take. And I think that's different in the cryptocurrency space. And I think that's why I actually think it's, you know, it's okay um, to have that risk if you know, there, is, you know, there is the potential reward on the other side. Uh, but I guess this, this brings us uh, to a sort of uh, the topic. I mean, you just mentioned it, Sebastian, right? The, the question between a, an investment versus uh, a product sale. So, uh, Lisa, has it? I mean, it's been my impression that uh, companies uh, have framed in the cryptocurrency space their the crowdfunding campaigns as 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 product sales. Is is that correct? Has that been your experiences as well? That's right. Um, so it's I I see the community and I know that they uh, approach these projects as viewing it as an investment sometimes because they're purchasing something, they're anticipating the value to increase. Um, but it's like I see it as you know coming from the tech side, um, working within technology for so long. It's this dilemma of open source. How do we fund open source development, and how do we do it in a way that incentivizes developers, creates scarcity for you know the product? Um, and in the case of Ether, like you mentioned, you're buying Ether. Um, you're not sure whether the product will come out. You're hoping that the value of the Ether will increase. Um, and you know if you're a smart uh, participant in the crowd sale or sorry, token sale, you will watch the project, watch for the test releases and Ethereum has released a testnet and right now you can mine test Ether um, and if you want to actually build a dApp on Ethereum you need Ether um, so when they do release their product which I've heard is going to be really soon they push the date a few times but you know I wish I had some Ether to use so I could buy uh, and use it within the network um, but it goes back to the point that you know it's it's not an investment because what you're doing is you're purchasing the right to gain access to the network at a future time, and depending on the resources available in that network, you know if it's of high value, that the value of your token will increase. You're right, of course. But then if you actually you know if you actually want to build a app later and use etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, of course you can buy it at that time. It's uh, there's no yeah. So there's this thing with Ethereum right now where it's free to create um, a feed. And it's, there's only so many, um, I guess, spots available to do that. And if you're the first one there, then you have the advantage. If you have Ether ahead of everyone else, you have the advantage of claiming more resources in the network. So in that sense, um, people that participated in the Ethereum crowd sale, I have not participated in any crowd sales, um, but for those that did, they... You haven't participated in any crowd sales? No, I have not. I actually don't You're have... a bad advocate of crowd sales then. <laughs> I, uh, I, yeah, I, it's, I sit in this weird area where, you know, I only have Bitcoin, but um, it's not that I don't believe in it, but then I, 
I try to take a very um, balanced view and there are sometimes challenges with the projects we work with and we try to make sure that you know you address those challenges and for that reason we don't want to accept the coin because then we're taking a bias. Yeah, no, that, that definitely makes sense sort of in a professional role, right, if you work directly with the projects. I think that's a, a very a laudable and good position not to take the coin, not get paid in that currency, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think personally, I, you know, what we're talking about, of course it makes so much sense, you know, this op op uh, monetizing open source software in this way, it's just, uh, it's absolutely brilliant and uh, it's clearly, uh, clearly makes a ton of sense. I mean, Bitcoin, in a sense, is a bit like that, right? Like that, the Bitcoin early developers, you know, they had Bitcoins because they were worth nothing at the time and it gave them an incentive to work on this. And So, it, uh, there's no question in my mind that this is a, a brilliant model. It, it makes a lot of sense. It works. Um, but that being said, I mean, there's also no question in my mind, it, it works precisely because people treat it as an investment. Uh, and whatever now the the project creators think of it or frame it, etc., like, you know, that's just uh, that's just the reality, right? And and then I, I, I think where it's going to be interesting is how um, how governments and law enforcement, etc., will look at this, right? Whether they will sort of look at uh, maybe the terms of conditions, if you, if you think of Ethereum, right, they had uh, terms of conditions where they've specified, you know, paid lawyers a lot of money to do that, uh, yeah. uh, terms of uh, product resale, and and if they sort of accept that and say, like, yeah, that's a, that's a face value, like, then it should be fine, right, because you can do that with product resale. But if they look at it more, sort of maybe take a step back and say, oh, but how do people treat that? Uh, yeah. Well, then I could see that getting uh, getting some some projects, you know, into some difficulties. But I guess I, we'll see. I I agree. I think it was back in October, November. There was a project called BitNation, um, and they were approaching their crowd sale in a way that you know we are not incorporating uh, as a formal entity. Um, and uh, just like Swarm, they were also talking about crypto equity. So there's this question of what will happen to these projects um, and uh, so far nothing. Um, yeah, so uh, far, but... Um, well, I mean, didn't, but uh, uh, Eric Voorhees got some fine because he was selling like uh, some sort of equity in Satoshi Dice on Bitcoin Talk. Um, uh, I read that he sold Satoshi Dice and didn't report his, uh, his income from the sale. No, no, I think he he got a fine for selling uh, equity in that thing. Um, I, I don't know. We, we, could, we could check it, but yeah, anyway. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think you're right, right? So the, there is a sort of, um, there's a question, and it's an open question because we don't know yet. We haven't really seen action, and, and maybe everything will be fine, uh, of how lawmakers are going to treat uh, those crowd sales that make the effort of, of, of trying to make it a product pre-sale. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I think for those, and, and there have been, I mean, maybe people, projects have become more careful at the moment uh, who have actually phrased it as like we are selling equity here. And, and there, I mean, I, that's of course a huge liability they're carrying and sort of at any time, right, they could get in trouble for that. Today's magic word is strategy, S-T-R-A-T-E-G-Y. Go to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So can you tell us, Lisa, what has been sort of your experience and uh, the spectrum of what uh, these projects have been framing their their coins at as investments, or equity, or products, and what, in your opinion, is right now sort of the best approach uh, from a uh, cautionary perspective? So, um, network sale, network token sales, which is what we're calling them, uh, they are not an investment, but they are a purchase of the right to access a network at a future time. So just like software licenses, you know, you purchase the right to, you know, the next Call of Duty um, or the next, you know, Halo before it's out. Right, you're buying that right to use the game before it's officially released, and that's how tokens operate in the same sense. 
um, they've software companies and gaming companies have been doing this forever. You know, you can buy Windows 8 before it came out. Um, uh, crypto companies in particular have started incorporating in places like Switzerland and in the UK, and uh, they are um, making sure that you know they're they're releasing a token and communicating that it's a technology product um, before the, you know the actual crowd sale happens. I mean, I think that's actually another important point to bring up here, right? Because one thing is like what's the legal status of this like in the US or something like that but uh, like you know that's one question the other question is about enforcement and of course if you are somewhere else and maybe it's legal in the local laws but it's not legal going in the US uh, you may just say I don't care right and yeah. um, I think that's a perfectly legitimate position to have yeah. uh, and, and uh, that's a great advantage of, of cryptocurrency space is that you can you can often do that kind of thing and you go just wherever uh, you find a local um, a local jurisdiction that's okay with that, but maybe mm -hmm. e even uh, maybe even no jurisdiction. I mean, that, of course, that's I don't know if that's advisable. Um, probably not, because you have to have a probably not. Um, yeah. So some have set up in Switzerland, some are going to London, and um, especially like the way Coinify has incorporated in the U.S., they've consulted like lawyers and have um, you know a requirement that you sign up and register so I would definitely use Coinify if I was to launch a token sale um, and I would also incorporate in Switzerland but then there's the question of like consumer protection laws you know so, um, so regarding this network token sale approach I mean is, is it foreseeable that sometime in the future like all these projects will get slapped on the wrist because um, the law didn't see it uh, that way. I mean, uh, that in fact they were interpreting it as an investment. So there's the question of like whether it will be seen as an investment, and will they be penalized as an investment, or will someone that has purchased a token complain to you know the uh, their local jurisdiction about you know consumer rights, um, you know fair business practices, uh, you know those things that protect regular consumers when they purchase a product. Um, and then there's the crowdfunding laws. You know, under a million, did they know what they were buying? Um, uh, yeah, I I think in the future we'll see something possibly happen. We know that they're looking at Bitcoin. So. Right. No, but there's, there's, a, there's a whole gray area there, and we don't know what's going to happen. In fact, we've been advised by some people, like you know, to be careful about what we talk about. In fact, and so I mean, I think that's probably uh, somewhat exaggerated. But um, it it is a very gray area. In I mean, if I was launching a crowd sale, uh, I I would really want to think twice about whether or not I'm gonna be fined or penalized in the future for uh, selling mm -hmm. something that uh, was in fact illegal or um, mm -hmm. against consumer protection laws, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I also think like one one thing that I I feel sort of conflicted about, you know, if, if let's say we, we did some advertising for crowd sale on, on this podcast, uh, which, I, I personally, which we have actually, yeah, but so I personally, I feel like one thing that, and maybe we didn't do that so well, or we didn't do that properly, is one thing I think that one should do is have a disclaimer, like this is risky, you know, it, it can go wrong, but it also has this a potential upside, right? So like people understand it in that in that context, and then I think it's fine, right? Because people are like personally, I feel like people should be able to make that those choices, uh, whether or not that's legal or not is a different question, right? But just sort of from a personal like ethical thing, uh, you know, I think that's fine. But of course, that implies you have to make that kind of disclaimer that you know it does have this kind of upside. It can get very valuable, but it can also be totally worthless, and this is speculative. Uh, yeah. and that was a little bit, I mean, I don't know to what extent, but I, it seems to go a little bit against and the framing it as, as a product pre-sale. So, uh, sorry, do you want to? Yeah, um, yeah, no, go ahead. So, like, we both work in this, like, area, like you guys and us at Vandex, work in this area of talking about what's happening in this space. And uh, we have to be kind of aware that, you know, we're not going to promote pump and dumps because there are those. They do exist. Um, and but there are those projects that are you know really quality like Ethereum, you know um, that have a good team. They have a solid project, and we can talk about the product. 
um, we're not going to endorse that people buy the coin because that's their choice. But we can talk about the value of the technology and what it can do. And I think that's where you know where we are. Um, and we can add a disclaimer. We add a disclaimer when we work with projects. Like we're not responsible. You accept full responsibility. You own all the content. We are just here as advisors. Yeah, absolutely. So before we move on, uh, I'd like to take a break and talk about our sponsor. Not a pop and dump scheme. <laughs> Not a pop and dump scheme. Shapeshift. So Shapeshift is the they're, fast they're the good way to... Uh, sorry, Brian? No, no. No, okay. So Shapeshift is a fast and easy way to buy and sell altcoins. And since we're talking about coins, uh, this is a great way to get some of those coins uh, if, you're, if you're interested in, in, in getting some altcoins. So Shapeshift is the currency converter tool which allows you to convert any uh, Bitcoin into about 25 different cryptocurrencies. Uh, they support uh, about 25 currencies I mentioned. So uh, Litecoin, Dogecoin, Mintcoin, Unobtainium, Clams, I just noticed they added uh, clams. I'm not sure what that clams. is. If you guys know what clams are, uh, I'd like to get Sounds some. Sounds edible. Yeah, they sound like edible coins. So with, what's nice about Shapeshift is that you don't have to have an account with them. You don't even have to give them your email address. You simply uh, choose the currency you want to convert and the currency you want to convert to. You put the address uh, of the currency you want to convert to. You send them say Bitcoins for instance for Dogecoin, you send us some Bitcoin and in just a few minutes you have some Dogecoin in your account. Uh, it could be, uh, you, know, you could send it to your own wallet, you could also send it to uh, a merchant. So for instance if you have some Dogecoin or perhaps some, some Mintcoin and uh, you want to buy something with Bitcoin, well you would just put their Bitcoin address and you shapeshift to make that conversion. The nice thing about it is it takes only about 30 seconds to do the conversion. Um, so go to shapeshift.io, give it a try. Uh, also, one thing I like to mention, uh, they have an affiliate program. So, if you're a wallet developer, if you wallet, if you have a, if you develop a wallet or any some any sort of uh, wallet service or wallet tool, and you want to give the ability for your users to convert uh, their uh, altcoins into Bitcoin, you can integrate um, Shapeshift right into your wallet with their affiliate tool and you'll actually get a little commission uh, on the back end for uh, trades that uh, happen uh, with Shapeshift. So Shapeshift.io, buy and sell coins instantly with no accounts needed and we'd like to thank them for the support of Epicenter Bitcoin. Uh, so coming back to crowd sales, Lisa, so you've been involved in quite a few crowd sales. Uh, can you uh, talk to us about the different crowd sales you were involved with? Sure. Um, so I started, um, I guess, working within Bitcoin uh, with Mastercoin. And uh, during that time, they did Made Safe. And I was working on a project called Tatiana Coin. Um, it was right around then that Adam Levine was starting to talk about LTB Coin. And uh, he went with Counterparty. Um, he was the first one that actually sent me a Counterparty and encouraged me to kind of take a look at it. Um, and it was quite easy. I created, you know, half a million green coins, and I sent him 500,000. No one will buy my coin, though. It's kind of, I don't know, understand why. Um, and uh, after, um, after that, I worked on uh, David Johnson's API network. Um, there was storage, uh, Swarm, as well as um, a few others. There was Gems, uh, something called Merchant Coin, uh, more recently Scenario, and uh, Factum, uh, Lazoo's. So tell us, what are what are the the things that uh, software developers or I mean, people uh, engaging in a crowd sale um, should consider in terms of launching a, a successful crowd sale? Um, so if someone's considering doing a crowd sale or a network token sale, um, they should for one. Uh, have a very clear idea of what they are trying to launch. It's not just about doing a product and like having a few lines of code and saying this is what it'll do, but what is the business going to be afterwards? Where is the money going to go? Do you have a clear idea of like who's going to use your product? Um, and based on like that, that's your story. You have to communicate that story through you know the white paper. Make sure it's saying, you know, the technology is there, this is exactly how it will be used, what people can anticipate when it's out, and on the other side, 
making sure like the business is set up. If you're going to incorporate, um, if you're going to, you know, set up as a nonprofit, which is what a lot of people have done. Um, so just being transparent in how you're set up and making sure that you're communicating where the money is going and what the technology will be. Do you feel that a lot of the crowd sales that we've seen so far in the cryptocurrency space have been successful in, in being transparent uh, before they launched their crowd sale? I think it's always a challenge. Um, this is something that we uh, are usually brought. So with Vanbex, we we're usually brought in through word of mouth. Um, people are launching a coin and they are needing some advice or guidance at some point, and uh, they um, they bring us on because we we tell them this. And the projects we work on do understand that. And I'd like to say that they are more successful because of us. Um, I mean, I really like your emphasis on white papers. I think that's a really, uh, really good, a good thing because just if somebody has to write a white paper, right, you uh, like have to sit down properly, think through it, and, and you know put the thoughts on paper. I think well, first of all, it certainly you know, it's a good process for the teams themselves. To really it does force you to be structured in a way. Yeah, force you to be structured, force you to really think through, and also, of course, it makes it obvious if people haven't done that, right? I mean, if somebody can't write a proper uh, explanation, uh, you know, then that, that's definitely a warning sign. And and I think that's, um, you know, business plans, right, they're sort of out of fashion today. Nobody seems to write a business plan anymore. So, uh, and there's certainly something to be said for that, right, because then people write a business plan and they never do anything that's in the plan and the plan is, uh, tends to become irrelevant. Uh, but that being said, there's certainly value in t in terms of like a business plan and that it actually forces you to you know think. Uh, and uh, I think the white paper is, is a great a great thing to take that role. And mm -hmm. so, so I, I'm I'm a big fan of that part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, that the white paper is almost needed in the crypto crowd sale. It's like the equivalent of the business plan in, in the startup industry. Um, but a white paper is almost more. Uh, complex in that you have to say here's what we've done, here's what's coded, and here's what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Whereas a business plan could be based on nothing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, a white paper makes it much harder to hide behind the stock photos and and pie charts. So uh, fancy videos and yeah, nice looking websites aren't aren't enough for crypto crowd sales. So when when launching a product. Uh, an open source product, for instance. At, at what stage of development should one consider uh, doing the crowd sales? Should it be you know, very early on, uh, or should they at least have some code uh, written or a good part of their code written? Uh, so someone asked me this recently, like when should they have the crowd sale? And it's it's not really like something you can set in stone. You should start talking about your project soon, as soon as you can. Um, go on the threads, go on the forums, start talking about what you want to do, and then, um, and when you know, when the community is starting to give positive feedback, you've gone through that process of having people ask you questions, um, and it's that vetting process. And when you're going through that, that's when you know that you are almost ready to launch the crowd sale date. Um, that's kind of how we gauge when crowd sales should launch. So you you you, you mentioned uh, posting on forums and, and Reddit and such, and I, I assume you're talking about sort of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency related forums. At what point do we permit ourselves to get out of the Bitcoin? cryptocurrency forum space, uh, which I think you mentioned earlier was sort of quite peculiar in the types of people, uh, sort of the demographics of people that, that, that yeah. uh, live there. Um, at what point do we move to other more traditional communications platforms, social networks where sort of the masses live? Yeah, um, I think it's uh, you have to do them both. Um, go both as well on Facebook and Twitter and like for storage because it was a uh, decentralized cloud play. You know they appeal to people outside of Bitcoin. Um, they were on places like Infowars. You know, um, so going out early and uh, just talking yeah, about I mean, Infowars still. I mean, it's 
Yeah, it's kind of anarchist. It, it is sort of like anarchist libertarian. It, it's very it's very close to I guess brother. Yeah, but yeah, well, of course the challenge is right. So if if you're gonna try to convince people who aren't already Bitcoin users, uh, the hurdle is so much bigger because they don't only have to say like, okay, I believe your project, etc. They also have to go out and buy bitcoins. They have to like familiarize themselves, like, oh, how do I now send this thing somewhere else? And then also the process, right? I mean, if you participate in a crowd sale, uh, you know, you have to do some things, whether it's set up counter wallet and stuff. I mean, that's just so many hurdles that right. I, I think it's unrealistic to try to do that. So, so it makes no sense. So to it's too early, on. is what you're saying? It is just so many hurdles. I mean, I, I think it's you're gonna have to focus on cryptocurrency users because the other ones. Uh, I mean, it, yeah. of the ones you convince of your project, you're probably gonna lose like ninety percent on the way because they can't figure out something or they get scared or they're confused. And I agree. Like Bitcoin people are a certain demographic, and like we've discussed already, they they hang out on certain forums and they read certain things. So. I would say like focus 80% of your marketing and PR on Bitcoin and 20% elsewhere like on regular social media, regular, you know, if it's like a, a social networking project, then hang out on the P2P foundation forums, you know, those um, and even anarchist forums. But you're going after people that have Bitcoin already because they're like the low hanging fruit. So you want to go where they are. So can you talk a little bit about the, the different platforms that have been used? So I, I know, I mean, I think originally, right, MasterCoin sort of uh, was used for some things. It seems recently Counterparty has become more popular. What are the pros and cons here, and where do you see this going? Um, so Counterparty and MasterCoin are uh, interesting in that they both sit on Bitcoin. They use uh, protocols. Um, they use metadata for uh, putting their information into the Bitcoin blockchain, which is then, you know, passed to the Bitcoin miners. Um, the difference between the two is, well, they're, they're similar in technology. Um, MasterCoin, now called Omni, uh, they are using, uh, I think it's, I forgot what it's called, it's not uh, op return. Um, but to be sure, Counterparty has a, uh, come out first with an easy-to-use wallet. They charge a little bit of XCP um, to create coins. There's no limitation, like there's no correlation between how many XCP you need and how many coins you can create. Like I think I used 75 cents and I made like 9 million coins. Like it's kind of crazy. Um, and Counterparty to date has launched way more than MasterCoin. Um, Omni, just as Omni has taken the very slow approach, um, they have yet to release a stable wallet. They will be doing that soon, and um, I think they're just kind of hedging their uh, their bets in the sense, letting Counterparty go forward and test the waters for the well, industry. Well, <laughs> that's a very uh, positive way of phrasing it. No, I mean it, it seems yeah. like I mean even David Johnson himself said, "Look, no, they've had like lots of problems. You yeah. know, the limitations were incompatible. They had to like start over with the whole code base and stuff." So, yeah, so. it was bad. Uh, for sure. Uh, yeah, so I'm, the project, I'm, yeah. I'm curious, what are your guys' uh, thoughts on uh, why um, colored coins and open asset based uh, protocols haven't taken off? Um, oh, oh color, colored coins. Um, well, the colored coins team, uh, Amos, um, who I spoke with, we helped them recently with some marketing. Uh, they actually raised some venture capital funding. Um, and uh, they have hired a, a full team, and they're formalizing the Colored Coins protocol. So they're working specifically to kind of create um, a formal Colored Coins technology and allow people to create tokens for the Internet of Things. Yeah. Um, I, they, they've been slower, for sure. Well, I mean, I think one problem of the Colored Coins stuff is know that they uh, well. There are from there are protocols, right? But they're different ones, so, so they're 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 not compatible with each other. So you know, one is a coin prism of uh, Flavien, uh, whom we had on as well. But then there was another one called Chroma Wallet, and you can't use one with the other. And then, yeah, and yeah, I think uh, Flavien mentioned this as well, right? That uh, there's a uh, now some people who try to have 
formalized it somewhat, which I think will be based or similar or compatible with, uh, with the open asset protocol, which I think Flavia has done. So, but it's a good question. I don't know why not. I mean, it seems, yeah, it's a uh, who knows. I mean, well, I'm, not, I'm not sure why this hasn't been so more used. Well, like the Colored Coins team, just like any of the other teams, have had their own ups and downs. And, um, you know, Amos and uh, some of the other guys, they uh, took a while to kind of figure out what they wanted to do with Colored Coins. Um, so they might surprise a few people later this year with when they release. Um, if you remember Reddit Notes, they were going to use yeah. Colored Coins. As well. Yeah, uh, I hope so because I, mean, I really like the project and I really like the implementation of it. I think they're, they're, they have a really good approach. I, I, mean, I think the important thing though here to, to point out is that there's not like a project, Color Coins, right? Like Color Coins is super old. They, they've been right. like Vitalik was working on no, that. Sorry, what, what, I meant, what I meant was uh, Coin Prism. Coin Prism, yeah, yeah. No, Flavian is. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's one of the challenges, right? So the idea is age is old and different people have worked on it for different times. Some people have gone this direction, done incompatible things. And, and, and you know, maybe uh, to some extent, it is also related to the fact that they don't have their own currency, so you don't have a development fund that can, you know, sort of pay a team to work on this, but they have to, uh, you know, Maybe go different ways, and, and that makes it uh, makes it a challenge. Yeah, I, actually, they were um, interesting in that they raised venture capital funding from you know pretty prominent VCs in New York, and uh, I'm talking about Kolu, um, who's formalizing the Color Coins protocol. So unlike Counterparty and Mastercoin, this was the only team that raised you know the traditional funding. Um, the went the traditional funding route, so it shows that there is interest in you know what's happening in Bitcoin and tokenization, um, and yeah, there's investment available for these companies. Yeah. So coming back to you, to your personal experience with Vanbex, um, you know, you've worked on a variety of of different uh, crowd sale products uh, projects. Uh, in fact, probably a good portion of the sort of ones that we've heard the most about you've worked on. Uh, which ones really stood out as being very unique and uh, which one do you think well which ones do you think will be the most successful? Um, I really like storage. Uh, I still like storage today. Um, they're going to release the beta out and uh, people that participated in the crowd sale are able to get in there first. Um, some of the guys on our team uh, were participants and they're telling me how you know they got their invite already to storage and it's actually really cool. Um, so I think that they have a lot of promise and you know their coin went up in value so that was a good sign. Um, not because you know it's an investment but because people wanted to get in the product. right? Yeah no I agree. I mean I, I remember having um... Uh, Sean on it. It, it, it. To me, it seemed like so the the project that had the most potential and it actually had real use. You know, that we could actually use uh, on a day to day basis um, and has real value. So I, I think that plays a lot in uh, mm -hmm. in the coin uh, having gotten so much attention and and, and raising yeah. value, like you mentioned. Um, it's like just to finish that, it's a yeah. so they had a very clear story, right? Um, this is what companies should, if they're considering crowd sale, like look at how storage has done it. It was a very clear product model, clear use case. You knew how you were going to use it. You knew what the coin was going to be for, um, and they were uh, able to release, you know, versions and screenshots of what the beta is going to look like, um, and they had a white paper as well. So mm -hmm. those are all the good things that we look for. And what are some of the projects that you have on your radar uh, that are coming up that, if, that you may, may be able to talk about that uh, you're looking forward to? Sure. Um, so Factum is one of the projects that we've worked with um, for the longest. And uh, I really like what they're doing with their partnerships. And uh, they have some really cool things that are going to be coming out um, in terms of land title registry um, that... Uh, you know, are going to really show the use case of Factum because it's such a complex and uh, at the same time they say Factum does nothing. Um, so we, telling that story in a way that, you know, outlines how people will use it um, and that's kind of the area that I'm working with them. That's one thing I'm looking forward to. Um, so watch for that. 
Um, the other thing is that Swarm is actually uh, going to have another Swarm class soon. And they have some really cool uh, projects coming out, um, which we've been able to kind of uh, be there and listen to and um, ask questions about. Um, so that, that will be really cool, too. That will be coming out soon. Yeah, with regards to the fact that so when we had them on, it, like you said, it, it, it seems so abstract. And then, you know, recently we were in Berlin, we, we saw Peter Kirby there, and it seems as now they sort of have use cases, one of which being these land titles. Um, Brian, what, what do you think about uh, Factum and how it sort of evolved as in, in, in practical use cases? I mean, I, I think Factum it makes a lot of sense, right? Like the, that, that the, the, the potential utility is sort of, you know, made clear to me. Uh, like why this would be useful for like a whole variety of things. I mean, I remember when we had um, Peter Kirby on the, on the podcast and Paul Snow, uh, they talked about, you know, the idea that like a bank has all these like like mortgage applications and they can use uh, something like a blockchain to just prove like all they existed at that time and they weren't forged after it's the documents. So that, that's just a, a very obvious uh, case, right, where, where you can achieve uh, a much better transparency and reduce fraud, etc. So one could imagine at some point maybe governments requiring this kind of thing. So I, I think there's a very strong use case there. Um, of course, everybody could do this on their own, right? Like it, it's, I mean, you could hash documents on your own, put it in the blockchain. In a, in a sense, you don't need factum for that. But then, of course, nobody is going to do it on their own because it is, it's, uh, you know, it's too much to ask, right? People want to have an easy solution. So, I mean, I personally, I see it, factum does make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I think um, uh, it's kind of funny in the way that like how Bitcoin projects, especially, are trying to tackle so much it's so in one go. You know, they're, we're trying to solve voting and we're trying to solve you know geopolitical rights, and on the other side, we're trying to decentralize the internet and trying to create this whole decentralized infrastructure. It's such a large concept um, that some of these projects are coming with, and then here is Factum with just very simple uh, and very um, basic. Uh, approach to what they're doing and that I think it's kind of getting missed like they're not trying to save the world it's just trying to make things provable and try to say something exists yeah absolutely no I mean it's a simple thing but then of course if you think of all the applications and implications you know the, who knows where it's gonna go right there, there, there's like an endless amount of things that could be done with it potentially and then I guess the difficulty will be you know, to actually develop all those businesses, uh, you know, because uh, sort of on its own, uh, Factum probably won't have a lot of use, right? Somebody will have to take this uh, and build something on top of it for specific use cases uh, where there, there is actually a requirement. Because, I mean, in the end, things, a proof of existence has existed for a while. I actually use it once. But you could pay like it was like five millibitcoins or something, and you can hash your document, put it in the blockchain. I mean, this has been around for a while. Uh, but who's going to use that? I mean, it's there's uh, you need to have specific use cases, and and I think that the challenge is going to be there. But I, uh, I agree. Maybe it's like I'm trying to think of an analogy, and it's like um, it's like a, a CMS, like a content management system. Like when they first came out with it, like what are we going to use this for? Like it just manages content. Like how abstract is that? Like what, why would we need to do that? We can already, you know, put content on the web. Um, but then, you know, like WordPress, it frames it in a way that makes it easy for the user to use it um, and get those same advantages out of doing it themselves, but they're walk through the process and kind of handheld. And I think that's fact. And, Cool. So, Lisa, uh, what's your view? Where do you see this whole crowdfunding and cryptocurrency crowdfunding space evolving to? Um, I think that we'll see probably more projects. Um, in the last year alone, you know, MadeSafe was only like a year ago. Um, and we've seen so many projects already come out that want to pursue that model of, you know, raising Bitcoin um, so that they can launch their software. Um, we'll probably see more projects that kind of try to go for the network token sale but don't really capture the spirit of why 
crowd sales are started in the first place, to fund open source development, to kind of uh, have community people involved in the process of you know participating in the the beta, the usage, and the growing of the network. Um, if we see you know projects that come out and just try to pump their coin, uh, it's not good for crowd sales, but that's what will probably happen. Yeah, so you think it will just be uh, rather than uh, being used as a way to fund open source software, uh, companies will just use it as a as a way to make money. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Definitely. that's a that's an interesting point, and uh, I, I'm sure we have seen that already with some yeah. of the projects. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully, you know, platforms like CoinFi yeah. uh, will help uh, build trust. Uh, I, and, uh, and, yeah. The, you know, and others as well, but you know, having uh, a couple of successful crowd sales will help build uh, trust with uh, users who want to invest. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I think that's one thing we didn't mention, and, and maybe it, it, it's worth uh, worth bringing that up briefly. Is that you know, w one thing Quantify has started doing, at least with some of their projects, is that they hold uh, a part of their funds in escrow. I mean, I think, for example, with Gems, and it only gets released upon uh, reaching certain milestones. And, and I think that's a fantastic thing, right? And then they have uh, some independent people who act as a sort of, you know, as, as judges to say, like, has this milestone been reached? So I think I remember with Gems, it's, it was some of the counterparty developers who, who fulfilled that function, some, like, trusted uh, known people in the community. And, and I think that's a, I mean, that's a, a great model, and, and I see that uh, mm -hmm. becoming yeah, I think that's standard. Fair. Um, just like how, you know, on Bitcoin Talk, they had uh, people doing the group buys um, and uh, people doing escrow. And those people were trusted, right? They had to have high reputation. They were given testimonials, positive ratings. Um, and they, they were uh, evaluated based on that, and people used their service um, and put money into it based on those factors. And with crowd sales, we don't have that yet. Um, I think Coinify is one of the first. Um, and uh, just like Factum, uh, we announced on Monday that uh, Factum's crowd sale will be managed by Coinify, and there will be you know several milestones for development that have to be achieved for Factum to receive the uh, bitcoins that they receive. Yeah, and perhaps we can imagine also sometime in the future, uh, and I mean, this doesn't seem very unlikely, where the sort of pools of people who validate uh, that a milestone has been reached, you know, it could be. Um, you know, decentralized people. Decentralized people. Yeah, it could be like a hundred people, a thousand people, and who would vote, like looking at the code, and would vote to uh, attest that a certain milestone has been reached, for instance, and then that would unlock the coins. You know, there, there's, there's all kinds of ways that we could do this. That's a great idea. Like that's an opportunity for someone to create a platform and say, "Hey, vote on this GitHub repo. Look at the number of commits. Look at the code. And if you know you're, if people are voting, then." And maybe it reaches a certain vote count, then the company should get the bitcoins. Like that's a great idea. Yeah. Start although, idea. although to be honest, I'm, I'm, I think there's a danger there, right? Because when you start having these kind of mechanisms, right, then nobody, nobody's vote has much weight anymore. So the incentive to actually really do the due diligence is like much lower. Because like here, what the advantage is is that someone is staking their reputation on taking the right. Decision, right? So, like now, the counterparty developer or something, he has to say, like, okay, has Gems reached that milestone? And when he says yes, right, like, I mean, he's putting his own reputation on the line. And if he does the wrong thing there, you know, people will not trust him anymore. So there is a lot of stake there. And then when you have a crowd of doing that, that's not anymore, right? Nobody's risking their reputation. So there's, I mean, of course, there is an advantage that it's not like a single point of failure, but there's also the downside. Nobody has anything at stake, and nobody is going to have an incentive to actually really look at the code. Um, That's a good point. But yeah, I mean, it, it could be, um, it could be, it could be a way to go. Well, I think places that, or companies like Factum will serve as those trusted agents, and you know, Bitcoin especially, we vet projects. Um, and uh, we, we question them, and we try to poke holes in them, and if you pass the process, then you win a customer. So before we wrap up, uh, I'd like to give you the opportunity to maybe talk about Vamvex uh, for a few minutes. 
Sure. Um, so at Vanbex, we um, we work in the background with Bitcoin companies, and we do a few things with marketing and grassroots PR and helping them communicate the story and framing their project in a way that you know appeals to their target audience. If they're selling a coin, uh, who wants to use the coin? What will the product be used for? And we help them understand that. Um, and then on the other side, we actually do a, a few um, things with non-crowd sale companies. Uh, there's one called Clef, which is a two-factor. Um, we're helping them with kind of getting an understanding of how to appeal to the Bitcoin community. And uh, there's another one called gem.co, and we're helping with writing technical documentation for them. Um, so we do a few things in Bitcoin. Um, we uh, work, our team of five uh, uh, tries to help companies uh, launch better and help them achieve their goals, whether it's more customers, um, better documentation, um, more community, or having a successful network token sale. Cool. Well, fantastic. And uh, yeah, I think this is going to be very interesting to see where this all goes. Uh, it's certain, in my view, that crowdfunding is not going to go away. It's going to play a very important role. And I think also these coin sales are not going to go away, whatever the legal questions are and whatever is going to happen. People will continue doing it and it will continue being a very interesting space. Interesting to see where this all evolves to. And uh, so thanks so much for joining us today and, you know, all the best with. Uh, launching lots of uh, successful new coins and uh, yeah there was thanks for coming on thank you guys uh, it's a great show and it was a pleasure being on I appreciate the uh, opportunity thank you. Yeah, thanks uh, it's, it's great to have you and uh, thanks to the listener for listening uh, we do appreciate your attention very much and uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter with epicenter BTC and uh, we'll be back next week uh, with another episode so I look forward to that. Cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Bye.